Dr. Mahmoud join already or not? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the international webinar of Faculty of Law, Muhatta University. First of all, let us pray and praise to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala because of His bless and mercy. On July 29, 2020, we get the ring in international webinar of Faculty of Law, Muhatta University, with the tema International Business Perspective in COVID-19 Pandemic. Let us greet and pray to our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who brought to source of truth where Al Quran and Hadis for our life. Ladies and gentlemen, from the voting of chairman of the International Webinar of Faculty of Law, Bung Hatta University, we know that participants who register the webinar are more than. Uh, 1,000 with the following uh, detail. The Honorable Director of Buhata University, Professor Dr. Tafdil Husni, MDA. The Honorable Dean of Faculty of Law, Dr. Kuning Pratima, Pratima Ratri. Honorable the moderator of webinar, Mrs. Florentina Ika, Walter GM Fev Hotel Solo. Honorable ladies and gentlemen, the participants of webinar series Hulti of Law University Bung Hatta. First, I will read the order of the international webinar for you. During the international webinar, we will turn off the participant sound. Second, the participants are give time to ask any question from chat, Zoom, and YouTube. Write your question and also the source who answer the question. Third, attendance list will be shared while the discussion the certificate will send to address that you write from that attendance form and uh, please list the active email press avoid any mistake on delivery the certificate ladies and gentlemen let us start the, the main event of international webinar of faculty of law from Hatta university Ms. florentina ika please guide this event to Ms. Ika Florentina, the floor is yours. Sorry, Ms. Ika, your uh, microphone. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the chance that you give to me. I can guide uh, the meeting for today. Uh, my voice is clear. Clear already, clear enough. Thank you for opening uh, this event today. First, I would like to ask for opening uh, the meeting today. So we will have a great occasion to talk about the business opportunity um, during the pandemic. But before we start the meeting, so we will ask one by one for the opening. The first is, Sorry, Miss uh, uh, Ika. Before yes. we start the discussion, uh, we welcome to speak. The, yes, yes. Uh, okay. Okay. The first is welcoming speech coming from Dean of the Faculty of Law, Bung Hatta University, to Dr. Uding Pratimarati, SHM, whom time is yours. Please. Ika, sorry. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable Mr. Professor Dr. Tafsir Rahmati, Professor Dr. Dr. Mia Mahmud Ibrahim, the Honorable Mr. Miko Kama, Mrs. Uh, Susana Muhammad Said, and Mr. Swamperi. Dear all participants who have joined the, the international webinar this afternoon, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let us offer thanks for. Sorry. Okay. On the presence of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, because of His mercy, we can gather in this event in good health. On this special occasion, allow me to say a word or two about the important, the importance of protecting myself from the danger of COVID-19. First of all, I would like to thank all the speakers who are willing to join and share their talk in an international webinar event. Although this event was prepared in just a week, all the speakers had prepared presentation material that will be shared for mm -hmm. the part participant. Second, I would like to thank all participants for their enthusiasm for being able to join the international webinar event. In this webinar, we choose the topic about international business perspective COVID-19 pandemic for several reasons. Namely, the COVID-19 pandemic has a tremendous impact on business activity. Businesses based on land will be able to survive, but conventional businesses tend to go bankrupt. Many companies reduce labor, reduce employee salary, delay credit to bank, payment to bank. Many companies experience conflict with labor, creditor, and debitor. Based on the research con conducted by the Watt Michael company tends the cut and resolving conflict. Alternative dispute resolution is one way to resolve business dispute today. There are several topics that we will be presented with by speakers, namely, International Business and Perspective COVID-19 Pandemic by Professor Dr. Safrinaldi. Legal application of unemployed people in the outbreak of COVID-19 in Indonesia Constitution Perspective by Miku, pa, pa, Miku Kama. Business Digital style Settlement by Pak Swamperi. Regulating Transnational Corporation Social Responsibility in New Normal by Uh, Professor Dr. Mia Mahmudur Rahim and minimizing legal risk on existing commercial contract during COVID-19 pandemic by uh, Dr. Susana Muhammad Said. Participants came from several regions in Indonesia as well as from Malaysia and Sudan. They are from uh, 74 regions in Indonesia from Agam, Ambon, and cetera. Webinar participants based on their profession, there are 2% prefer from private sector, 2% legal uh, practitioner, 12% government official, 34% lecturer, and 44% uh, student. This event carried out in collaboration with several institutions, Universitas Islam Ria, Universitas, uh, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, University of New England, Miko Kamal and Associates, Pevo Tel Solo, Diorama Radio Maseva Proclamator. Hopefully, this, co this collaboration will continue for the future. Pergi ke Surah Belajar Al-Quranul Karim. Al-Quran versi soft file mudah diakses. Thank you for supporting team. Hopefully, this webinar will be success. 
Thanks to Pak Atri, Mr. Atri, as head of the civil law and team preparing for this event. The supporting administrative section, Center of Information and Communication Technology, Fosticom. Special thanks for Mr. Dupati, who always supports webinar event at uh, Faculty of Law. Burung setayu hingga didahan, berserasa menyelamatkan Dewi Sinta yang manis. Thank you for all participants. I apologize if there are deficiencies. Finally, I say congratulations to fellow on the, the international webinar. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hmm. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Dean of Faculty of Law, Bung Hatta University, Dr. Uning Pratimarati, SHM Home, that already uh, welcoming uh, the speech. Then uh, the second occasion is the opening speech that will be uh, have for Rector of Bung Hatta University, to Professor Dr. Tafdil Husni, FMBA, time is yours. Thank you, Kak. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Good afternoon, selamat siang, dan salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Honorable Dean of the Faculty of Law, Universitas Mohata, Dr. Uning Pratimaratri, Vice Dean of Faculty of Law, Universitas Mohata, Honorable Invited Speakers, Professor Dr. Safri Naldi, SHMCL, Rector of Universitas Islam Riau, Dr. Mia Mahmudur Rahim, Associate Professor from School of Law, University of New England, Dr. Susana Muhammad Said from University of Bangsa Malaysia, Dr. Perry SIMH from Faculty of Law, Universitas Buahata, Miko Kamal SHLM, PhD as a legal government expert, distinguished guest participant, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for sparing your valuable time for this conference. Please allow me to address my deep condolences to all patients, families who are affected by COVID-19, and allow me to deliver my high gratitude to all paramedics who are still on duty in handling this pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Universitas Wong Hatta, I would like to welcome all speakers and participants in the international webinar conference under the theme International Business Perspective in COVID-19 Pandemic, held by Faculty of Law, Universitas Bung Hatta. This conference is meant to give some ideas from different perspective in managing business in the current hard and new normal situation. We know that COVID-19 has influenced all fields of life. The negative effect of this pandemic have ruined business plans. Many companies to close their door. Many employees had to be let off. We cannot predict how long this situation will last. Struggling and surviving are some of the best solution to this situation. How to struggle and survive in business will be discussed by our distinguished speakers today. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference was made possible due to high commitment of the Faculty of Law 
Universitas Bung Hatta. Allow me to express my appreciation to Chief of the Conference Committee and all her staff for working hard in managing this conference. I also thank all the national and international participants. We hope you can get the best out of this conference. Finally, by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, the International Webinar Conference under the theme International Business Perspective in COVID-19 Pandemic is officially open. Thank you for your kind attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Mr. Professor Dr. Tafdil Husni, SAMBA, as Director of Bung Hatta University that already officially opened the occasion uh, for this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for taking part of the international webinar, uh, International Business Perspective in COVID-19 Pandemic this afternoon. Today, we will discuss about how an in international perspective business in this pandemic by presenting five extraordinary speakers with um, Mr. Mia, uh, Dr. Mia Mahmudur Rahim, Associate uh, Professor School of Law, University of New England. And the second presenter is uh, Mr. Suamtri, Suamtri SHMH, the Lecturer Faculty of Law, Bung Hatta University. And the third is Mr. Miko Kamal SH, LIM PhD, the Legal Governance Specialist. And the fourth is Rector of Universitas Riau Islam, Professor Dr. H. Shafrinaldi SHMCL. And the five of our presenter is a Senior Fellow of Law, the Faculty of Economic and Management University, Nationally of Malaysia, Dr. Susana Muhammad Said. Okay. As mentioned by House, I'm Ika Florentina Faster GM for both Fev Hotel Manahan Solo and Fev Hotel Solo Baru in Solo, middle of Java, Indonesia, that will conduct the webinar this afternoon. Okay, to save our time, here we begin, begin the first presentation will be delivered by Dr. Mia Mahmudur Rahim. Let me introduce him. Dr. Mia Mahmudur Rahim is an associate professor in law and deputy head of School of Law at the University of New England, UNA. He joined this school having previously held position at the University of South Australia, UNISA, Queensland, University of Technology, QAT, and Macquarie University. And today, he will present about how the regulation transnational corporation social responsibility in the new normal. Okay, Dr. Mia Mahmudur Rahim, time is yours. Please. Thank you very much for the invitation and I'm so happy to join you here. And um, my honest thanks to the Dean of Law uh, and uh, also the rector of uh, this university. And uh, I'll try to pronounce your name as you know, nicely as I can, but uh, it could be a little bit different, but please uh, 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 convey, I mean, accept my apologies if I can't correctly pronounce your name. So yes, as uh, uh, Ilka Florentina mentioned that uh, the topic of my talk is related to transnational corporation and particularly yes. regulation of transnational corporations, corporate social responsibility in a very you know, uh, extraordinary situation. I call it new normal, right? Uh, could you please uh, uh, share my screen? Is it possible? Yes, please. Slide. Yeah. Done? So, 
So please share my screen to everyone, then it will be easier for me to present my talk. Are we sharing my screen? Uh, just a moment, please. Yes. Okay. Mm, no. Okay. Is it working? Yes, it is working already. Okay. Uh, full screen mode or? Okay. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the talk uh, for today from me will be related to transnational corporations and uh, uh, how to regulate them in a new normal situation, right? Now, to me, I think first uh, uh, I should uh, mention why I picked transnational corporation, right? I'm a regulation researcher. So I focus on different forms of regulation. And time to time, I take different guinea pigs like transnational corporation, then nanomedicine and global supply chain to test my understanding of regulatory forms. Today, I picked transnational corporation, right? So transnational corporations are good. You know, don't get me wrong. They are very good for many, many, many reasons. Three of the reasons could be like this. They're the agents of changes and te technology transfer. So in these days, it is not the states who are actually not changing the world. It is the transnational corporations by themselves or on behalf of other big states, they are bringing their technolo technologies in different parts of the world. So yes, they are a very vital part of our world development. They're the source of innovations and troubleshooting. Look for the medicines of this COVID-19. It is the transnational corporations who are actually putting their efforts and money and, and know-how, knowledge, right? It's not the states. It is actually Pfizer, right? It is actually not the other uh, big pharmaceutical companies who are trying to have uh, medicine against this pandemic. So. Transnational corporations are spreading the benefit of globalization, right? Yeah, they are bringing their money from this country to that country, bringing their technologies from this country to that country. So in this way, they are spreading the knowledge and creating the link. This link interconnectivity is actually globalization. And this is you know, really good for our you know, human development. There are some bad effects of it, but I think there are more good effects of globalization. Given this, sometimes corporations could be like devil, Frankenstein, right? If they are not ethical, right? If they are just profit mongers, if they are exploiting our resources for their narrow self-interest. So corporations are vital, but they are bad if they are not doing their work ethically, if they're just you know, focusing on profits and profits, right? My talk today is about regulating TNC's social responsibility performance. How TNC's such a great and powerful you know, actor in the world can do more for the society. And what could be the role of regulation so that the corporations will be more interested, more inclined to do better for the society. That will be the gist of my talk today. Now look, in the normal situation, for the last 50 years maybe, the corporations are actually not doing very well. They're doing very good things, but some of the bad things is, one of them is this. So corporate financial fraud. In the United States, this is the data from United States. The FBI found that you know, the litigations related to corporations are more or less, you know, 70% are related to financial fraud. So if there are 100 corporations in the United States and they have litigations, 70% of the litigations will be about their 
fraud, financial fraud. So this is something normal these days, right? Remember the financial uh, crisis or the Enron situation, the fraud with the data, fraud with the audit reports. This is pretty much normal. This is also normal. This is the oil spill in the Gulf, right? Yeah. So in 87 days, almost 4 million barrels of oil were just, you know, in the, in, in, in the sea. And because of that oil, the seashores are like this. So they are just damaging the world, damaging our natural resources. In every month, you will see that something is happening in the environment, which is damaging and done by the corporations. This is pretty much normal. Right? Another normal is this, modern slavery. So for modern slavery, it's not only the corporations who are responsible, states are also responsible, but you know, corporations are also related to this modern slavery. Right? How? In many days, most of the developing countries are heavily involved in global supply chains, isn't it? Yeah. And in the supply-driven global supply chain, the transnational corporations like Jesse Penny, Walmart, they're the leaders. They know that some countries are just exploiting the laborers. They're not <clears throat> giving rights to the laborers. But still, you know, they're not taking necessary actions. So I, it is like almost normal in Bangladesh, in Indonesia, in other countries like Sri Lanka, Nepal in these days, the transnational corporations are getting their supplies by exploiting the laborers, right? This is normal. Now, another normal thing is this, the carbon emission. Look. After 1950s, the carbon emission is so high, so high. Who are responsible for this? Yes, there are many, many actors, many parties responsible for this, but one major party is the transnational corporations. Because of their footprints, because of their production activities, the world is getting lots of lots of tons of carbon every day. But the transnational corporations, they are not really, you know, doing their best in terms of reducing the carbon emission. In other words, they're getting the benefit of it, right? So this is pretty much normal. We are debating about carbon emission for many years. The recent debate, you know, is with Mr. President Trump. He thinks that there is nothing called carbon emission. So this is normal, this is normal. But the new normal is this. Look, the new normal is this. So in these days, you know, we are like slaves of big, you know, corporations like maybe Apple, maybe Facebook, right? So everything they are saying, we are following. Anything, you know, said by Apple, you know, we are just doing it. They are controlling everything. Right? Without the Google map in, in these days, you know, people can't drive their cars. So if someone, the owner of the Google map, is changing the you know the map means that people will start driving in the wrong way so apple is actually always getting our data and based on the algorithm of the big data they are actually driving us in these days this is new normal i would not say that this new normal situation has been created by covid-19 this has been started you know uh, maybe for the last 20 years, the mm -hmm. COVID-19 has actually given it a new form, right? Another new normal is this, there is no privacy. So all your data in the Facebook or everywhere, if it is on the net, you know, it, it's not your property anymore. There are other guys who are, you know, piling this data and based on that, they are doing their business. So there is no privacy. There is no private information anymore. Whatever you are doing, eating or buying, you know, it's no longer private to you. This is new normal, right? Another new normal. This is particularly because of the COVID-19. You know, the small entrepreneurs are losing their market. The small entrepreneurs are, you know, it's like just shutting down their business as 
Mr. Professor uh, uh, Taf, uh, Tafadil Hus Husni, director of the university mentioned. Now, it is a very you know, extraordinary time when the small fishes in the, in the ponds will die. There could be some big fish and those fishes can be like you know the big catfish who will start eating everything. So the new normal is like this. Another new normal is this. Look, in earlier days we are used to go to the uh, you know different countries and universities and discussing our things, but now we are doing this, the Zoom meeting. I'm not telling that these these are bad, but this is different. This is extraordinary. To our dads, to our uncles, this is something uh, unbelievable, right? Yeah. So this is the new normal. Now my talk will be, you know, in the next two, maybe twenty minutes, uh, related to how to regulate the big corporations and their social part responsibility performance in a new normal situation, right? Yeah. In a new normal. So why? Why corporate social responsibility? Why? Special corporations. Why not USA, European Union, or China, or India, or Indonesia? Why transnational corporations? Because I think that in the new normal, you know, TNCs are the main main players. They are the big actors for everything. For everything. Oh, something. Someone put something here. You know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Look, the transnational corporations. The, their capacity. Microsoft, their, their, their revenue is almost, you know, bigger than eight Eastern European countries. One Microsoft is bigger than eight countries, right? Ruth, look. So this corporation's alphabet, you know, is equal to 38 African countries, their GDP. These are huge, huge, huge. And this has already been, you know, uh, acknowledged. The scholars like him. And Andrew, they have, he has mentioned that, look, consumers and employees, I'm reading the quotation, consumers and employees are now well informed about the challenges facing the world. They have little faith in government's ability. This has been evident. They acknowledge the corporations as the most powerful social construct. They are, and most importantly, they are willing to regard corporations who are responsive. These are given facts. States, United States, including Russia and everyone, look, you are not the big players. Corporations are the big players, right? And yes, corporations, you are the big players and we are willing to work with you as long as you are responsible for some of our things. This is the given, given stand, right? Look, because of this, after in, in uh, from February 2020 to July, uh, I think 22nd of July, look, the stock price of big corporations are like increasing, increasing. Zoom, Afterpay, Alibaba, Amazon. People are buying their things. Why? Because they are they are accumulating money, and people are interested to take some share of it. Because people has already learned that. These are the guys with whom I should go with. You know, because of this, you know, uh, mental or perspective or arguments, people are buying their shares and these shares are going up and up and up. Today, even the gold price has just dropped. I bought lots of gold shares, stocks, and I thought that this is a pandemic situation. So the golds are traditionally good stocks. But for the last one week, yes, the gold picked very high and then started dropping. But these companies, the Amazon, Facebook, going up, 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 up. Why? Because people has started losing faith in gold, has started getting faith in big corporations like this. Right? Yeah. Now, another thing, the software-based industries is coming, is coming. It will be 307 billion by 2026. It's every every year like 100 billions are adding up. So it's not about the mining corporations or petroleum. 
it's not about you know the arms industry it is about the software based service industries who will be you know the biggest market biggest thing in the world right so because of this i picked transnational corporations they are the big players they will be the biggest and this is our time to negotiate with them in terms of their responsibilities for the society okay now in the new normal there are for the regulation perspective in the new normal i think these are the cornerstones if you are a regulator you have to actually acknowledge this cornerstones one cornerstone is that the geographical control becomes less effective in regulation mm -hmm. right i am united states and you know i can do anything with facebook but actually not right actually not there is nothing physical resources in usa you know facebook is in the cloud you can't do anything you can't you know send your supersonic bombers to you know damage it no this is a different thing so the geographical <laughs> control like the sovereign states have is no longer a criteria for creating regulation and another thing is transaction cost and living standards are either increasing or decreasing i'm i'm not sure whether you know uh, it is the our life standard is getting better or not but i can see that you know there is a huge change and it is getting complicated day by day right so these types of things are not actually within the purview of sovereign power the sovereign power actually can't control your emotional state emotional status your feelings right and the big corporation in these days they have something big data with this thing they can even control your emotional status a state can't the state doesn't have this big data facebook can right yeah facebook can make you happy facebook can next day make you very you know pressured by your peers someone is a, your friend has got like 500 likes you got only 200 maybe it was 200 but facebook added 300 extra because of this your day is done you will be a whole day you will be like crying so a state can't do it facebook can and tnc's are at the center of the new normal in terms of resource in terms of technology in terms of uh, knowledge in terms of data in terms of communication in the new normal situation tnc is at the number one player of course estates are still players but tnc's are number one player to me right and look the tnc's are even making these things more critical they are actually bringing this new normal situation to ultra normal maybe in 30 years there will be one presentation like what should be the role of tnc's in ultra normal right yeah amazon is uh, uh, selling uh, some tickets uh, to go to, you know for the people who are interested to have a hotel suit in the moon in the mars maybe they are also going to build their headquarter in the moon on the moon on, or on the mars you know yeah maybe they are going to uh, create a medicine which will be like one pill for one day and people will start you know eating other things there will be no shop for meat we will just buy 30 pills for 30 days done right yeah google may have the supersonic you know bombers and they are already controlling the network in the in the cloud and they will have their own robots with the supersonic you know plans and they will control everything there will be no fbi or uh, the us sealed navy sealed no so in in next 50 years there will be ultra normal where these guys will be the main players right now in this situation how to uh, regulate their social responsibility performance how to make them more social so i would say humanizing transnational corporations what could be the role of regulation to humanize big corporations like google right there is one 
uh, theory. Uh, in this podcast pyramid, the Carol is saying that, look, you corporations, you should have four roles, right? What are the four roles? These are the four roles, four principles, right? One is that meeting objectives that produce long-term benefits. Do your business, but do in a way that it will create some long-term value, right? Don't just exploit the natural resource, take some natural resource, add some values to it, and then make a sustainably long, longer business. Use your power in a reasonable way. Yeah. yeah. If you're sure. allowed to have some woods from the jungle, then you know, have the woods in a gradual way. Don't just take everything in one day. Take some and plant some, right? Third one is integrating social demand. So corporations, yeah. you, are the, you, know, you are within the context of the society. Mm -hmm. You are one of the part of the society. So you can't just say that I don't care what the social values are here. If I'm a Exxon Mobil company and I'm in Africa, mm -hmm. my role is not to just dig the diamond from there. My role is also to take care of the values and the customs in Africa, right? The four principle, Carol is saying that, transnational corporations should contribute to a good society by doing what is ethically correct. Yeah. The Can we make it faster, Pamia? Yeah. Already 10 minutes? Just a little okay. reminder. Okay, then. I have 10 minutes, right? Yes, okay. sir. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll try my best. So, uh, yes, the corporations, you know, when you are doing business, you definitely will have lots of strategies. But, you know, your strategy should be based on you know, ethical standard. It should be ethically correct. It can't be unethical. It can be different, but can't be unethical, right? Yes. Now, what are the international things, regulations, or what are the regulatory framework for making the corporations responsible? There are many. We are in a bizarre condition, right? International framework we have, like Global Compact, Mm -hmm. like yellow tripartite declaration right? yep. we have corporate code of conduct Cadbury, walmart they have their own code of conduct we call it self-regulation right we have organizations global organizations like oecd e european yes. union or world bank they have you know uh, created some guidelines for transnational corporations yep we have private ordering system some vendors who are actually telling corporations to do something or not to do something. We call it a standardization of code of conduct for TNCs, like SA 8000, right? And the legislations. These days, some countries are trying to legislate you know, for the TNCs CSR activities. Like in even in Indonesia, law number 25 is saying that if you are going to invest, then you have to take care of these this, this social responsibilities. Right. In India, they said that you have to give 2% of your net profit for mm -hmm. social causes. The United Kingdom has said that you directors have to take social responsibility of your uh, company at the center of your decision making process. So self-regulation, private ordering system and the states, all are our international bodies, all are trying to come up with some regulatory strategies to regulates TNC CSR. But the problem is this. Look here, there are some you know, uh, strategies which are binding, like the laws by the states. There are some strategies which are non-binding, but mm -hmm. market-based, which are some self-regulatory strategies. So corporations are saying that it should be self-regulation. We will do our best in terms of raising social responsibility. But another group is saying that, come on, no, there should be some mandatory things. There should be some state force or social force so that you'll be bound to do some social things. So there's a clash and there is no consensus yet, right? Yeah. Now, United Nations tried to have a international instrument to regulate TNC's social responsibility, but after 18, 19 years, they tried and tried, but it failed in 1988. So there is no international instrument for this now. Now, what could be the regulation approach? 
as I said, it could be self-regulation. Company can say that we will do our best. Then it could be like soft regulation of CSR, indirect regulation made by the uh, states, not directly, but indirectly pushing the company to do something better for the society. Mm -hmm. It could be co-regulation where the state will pass a law and allow the corporation to do the rules part, you know, action part of it. So it could be international framework, it could be laws by the state, it could be self-regulation. Currently, it is actually self-regulation. Corporations are you know, now able to do their social responsibility things by themselves. And the result of this is this. One is saying that you know, the people are blaming corporations for carbon emission. And he's saying that, but we are offsetting all this carbon. Means that we are emitting the <laughs> atmosphere and we are paying for it. But the frog is saying that, so why is this carbon is still you know, setting me off? So it's not working. They're damaging the environment and paying. And there is a huge consequence but they are saying that we have done our part. Another thing is interesting. Huh? The discharging, you know, <laughs> green chemical things and saying that, look, we are so green friendly. Even our, you know, uh, wasters are green. So these are the gaming things are now happening. So, so of corporations. Now, co-regulation is interesting. Mm -hmm. Co-regulation means that both the regulatee and the regulator, the state and the sub regulation work together. There are some theoretical base of this argument. I'm not going to get into this theoretical discussion yes, now. Please. But <laughs> legitim legitimacy stakeholder theory are saying that, look, both the regulators and regulatees should work together. It shouldn't be only the regulator or the only the regulators. There should be a co-regulation. Now, if it is co-regulation, what could be the fundamental you know, framework? One framework already given is new governance framework. Mr. Clinton tried, Mr. Uh, what is his name? The Tony Blair, he tried mm -hmm. by his Better Regulation Task Force. Right? So in the governance, the new governance approach is already established. Now people are saying, like us, like me, is that what about following this new governance approach and frame a regulation for TNC's CSR performance. Then we found that <clears throat> these are these are the you know, scholars who has given lots of formats within the new governance approach. One, Christian Parker is saying that let's open the corporation. Everything in the corporation will be public. Even the board of directors room will be made access so that people can see you know, who is there and who are doing what. So yeah. lots of discussions are there. I'm not really, you know, sure, don't sure. have the time to spend all this time. The Anthony Giddens third way is interesting. Converging the powers of different, different parties mm -hmm. and then creating a framework where each of the party will use their power and the convergence of that power will give us a framework. It's interesting. If you have time, you can check their arguments. Now, Meta regulation is a regulation where, as I said, the convergence of the powers of different parties can happen. So what I'm saying is that maybe there can be a regulation where the objective, you know, the aim of the regulation will be fixed by the state. Then the law will allow the regulators, like the corporations, to frame their strategies. Law will not prescribe the company and tell them, okay, you have to do this in this, this way, no the law will give the aim, then the regulators, corporations will do their best mm -hmm. in terms of reaching the aim. So different companies will do different strategies in terms of reaching the aim. And there will be another party like consumers, like us, who will be also there with our power to oversee, to ensure their accountability. So it's not the matter of state and the corporation. It should be a matter of a state corporation and with the society. We must also have a role within the regulatory framework for regulating TNC's social responsibility performance. Now, what next? You know, but this thing is still not solid. As I said, uh, except of legislation-based regulation 
regulatory framework is outdated. You know, it is already proved that a state alone with its regulation can't actually do anything in terms of raising TNCs, you know, CSR performance. The resources for running a regulatory framework is actually not with the state anymore, right? The TNCs, they possess better knowledge and resources, better than the states do, right? And the TNCs these days, ironically, is controlling the big data. They have everything. <laughs> the states they don't have everything, right? Yeah. Yes. But unfortunately, the TNC's ethical standard is frustrating. Still, they are very much profit-centric. If still, you know, Mr. Uh, owner of Facebook, Zuckerberg, is whatever he is saying, he is always counting his profit margin. Not really, you know, ethically based business he is doing now. Now, I think that it's not only the regulation, not only the state, not only the corporations. I think we have a role. What about uh, ensuring good uh, quality education? Mm -hmm. So this good quality education will empower the consumers, inform the consumers, right? What about uh, you know, building the ethical standards within the society? If the society is not based on ethics, mm -hmm. if they don't have a value system, they can't actually you know, ask the corporation to be ethical. They can't. What about staying together? Right? What about communicating and you know, breaking the information asymmetry so that the big corporations can't actually play with us? So we have to increase our communication. Yes. Now, for communication, we have to rely on them. So there is a game thing there, right? So we have to raise our capacity by increasing our ethical standard, by increasing our education quality, by increasing our connectivity. Mm -hmm. With this, we can actually play the best in terms of you know, making our corporations more ethical. So these are my thoughts, these are my understanding, but still I'm working on it, right? I'm happy to answer any question if you have. Okay, that's all yeah. for today. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Mia Mahmudur Rahim, that already shared about the new normal situation in perspective in this pandemic situation, and also how important the community social responsibility support the business in this period. Okay, for all participants that want to ask the question, please write your question by chat rooms, and please mention your name, your institution, and also to whom question delivered to be. And right now, it's time for the second presenter that will be present about penyelesaian sengketa business that will be delivered by lecturer faculty of Law Bung Hatta University, Mr. Suampri, SHMH. Before, I would like to present his profile, a graduate from faculty of Law Bung Hatta University and then take started to in Andalas University postgraduate program, then follow to Andalas University postgraduate program for still going on right now for the doctoral program. And currently, he is the chairperson of the state administration law section in 2012 until 2019 period. After previously, he served as a head of personnel at Bung Hatta University in 2020, uh, 2012. For a certain time, following the second presenter in Faculty of Law, Bung Hatta University International Business Perspective in COVID-19 Pandemic. Mr. Swampari SHMH, time is yours. Ten minutes, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Mrs. Uh, Florentina. Yes. Uh, I can uh, speak in uh, Indonesian, eh? Yeah? It's so, okay. Sure, sure. It, it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Please, this all. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, terima kasih uh, kepada moderator Bu Ita Polerentina telah memperkenalkan uh, CV saya ya yes. yang sudah dibacakan secara bagus tadi ya dengan speed English. Kemudian tentu ya uh, sebelum saya mulai saya awali dengan Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Yang 
kami hormati Bapak Rektor Universitas Bung Hatta sebagai keynote speaker, yang kami hormati Ibu Dekan Fakultas Hukum sebagai apa pengant atau pengantar, kemudian yang kami hormati ya narasumber, ya narasumber dari eh, Profesor Dr. Safri Naldi, da, Pak Rektor Universitas Islam Riau. Yang kami hormati ya Mr. Dr. Miamah Mudurrahim, ya Associate Professor School of Law University of England, New England. Yang kami hormati ya Bapak Do, apa Miko Kamal, SA LM PhD, ini Legal Government Specialist. Yang kami hormati ya narasumber Mrs. Dr. Zuzana Muhammad Said, University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Host Zul Fadli Eskom MSC. Baik ya, uh, para webinar yang kami hormati ya pada siang hari ini ya, yang tema kedua yaitu penyelesaian sengketa bisnis ya. Penyelesaian sengketa bisnis ya eh, biasanya akan diselesaikan melalui bisnis ya. Karena kalau kemudian metode penyelesaian sengketa bisnis juga banyak ya alternatif yang dipakai. Tapi ya sebelumnya saya menguraikan ya saya bisa bisa minta di apa di ya tampilkan slide-nya atau screen. Ya, menjelang ditampilkan apa uh, slide-nya, saya memberikan statement sedikit ya terkait dengan penyelesaian sengketa bisnis. Ya, sengketa bisnis itu bisa diselesaikan melalui dua cara. Pertama, secara litigasi atau penyelesaian melalui pengadilan atau hukum formil. Uh, pengadilan ini juga ada di pengadilan negeri, kemudian ya, pengadilan agama dan seterusnya ya kemudian ada juga di luar pengadilan yang dinamakan non litigasi ya ya terima kasih ini slide nya sudah di, kita tampilkan ya yang pertama tentu terkait dengan jenis-jenis sengketa bisnis yang eh, satu sengketa perniagaan perniagaan ini tentu nanti bisa kita uraikan lebih lanjut ya Kemudian sengketa perbankan ya dunia perbankan ya masih ada sengketa di dalamnya kemudian sengketa keuangan atau finansial ya sengketa investasi atau investation kemudian sengketa perindustrian ada sengketa hak kekayaan intelektual atau haki kemudian ada sengketa konsumen kemudian sengketa kontrak kemudian ada sengketa keterangan kerjaan kemudian ada sengketa perdagangan publik sengketa properti dan sengketa lain-lainnya ya. Jadi tidak menutup kemungkinan ada sengketa lain yang belum tercantum tetapi kita ya ruang lingkupnya adalah sengketa bisnis ya. bagaimana dengan apa sengketa perniagaan? Perniagaan tentu ya di dunia perdagangan apa? Perniagaan itu bisnis atau perdagangan ada yang jasa, ada yang apa namanya terkait dengan perdagangan umum ya ini tentu nanti ada pola-pola penyelesaian daripada sengketa. Kemudian ya juga ya biasanya di dalam uh, sengketa bisnis, bisnis itu akan diselesaikan secara bisnis, maka ada para pihak yang akan menyelesaikan, baik pihak pertama maupun pihak kedua. Ada ada istilahnya di dalam uh, sengketa bisnis itu adalah yang pemohon dan termohon ya. Kemudian tentu ya para pihak pihak yang berbisnis melakukan upaya penyelesaian secara bisnis tentu dengan azas musyarah mufakat ya itu secara nasional ya nanti juga kita akan apa saya sampaikan bagaimana cara pembahasan ya bisnis secara internasional baik kita minta lanjutkan slide-nya Bu Yopi dan tim atau Bu Florentina ya 
Kemudian ya metode penyelesaian sengketa bisnis. Ya, ini tadi saya ulas secara apa? Secara umum ya. Ini ada namanya litigasi. Ya litigasi ini adalah proses penyelesaian sengketa bisnis. Ya tentu awalnya bisnis. Kenapa dia di, bisa masuk ke ranah litigasi? Litigasi karena ada eh, terkait dengan eh, apa namanya eh, unsur pidana, maka dia larinya ke litigasi ya secara peradilan tetapi ya apakah tidak terlibat dari dalam proses pidana apakah bisa di apa dimasuk secara litigasi dalam bisnis juga bisa dilakukan atau bisa di, dilaksanakan proses litigasi yaitu melalui peradilan umum ya peradilan umum itu berada di pengadilan negeri ya pengadilan negeri itu adalah peradilan yang berada di tingkat pertama Kemudian ya juga ada ya di pengadilan agama dan pengadilan niaga. Tetapi yang yang paling banyak di dalam apa proses litigasi itu adalah yang berada di pengadilan umum dan pengadilan niaga. Ya, pengadilan niaga ini ya di dalam apa namanya yang paling banyak di niaga ini di, di apa dicantumkan dalam undang-undang uh, bisnis yaitu terkait dengan undang-undang uh, hak kekayaan intelektual dalam menunda hak cipta apabila terjadi pelanggaran terhadap uh, ciptaan maka akan diselesaikan melalui pengadilan niaga ini dalam undang-undang juga telah tegas dicantumkan kemudian tentu ya uh, di dalam hak kekayaan intelektual yang lainnya seperti ada undang-undang merek kemudian ada undang-undang paten ya juga ya banyak menggunakan peradilan niaga dalam proses apa penyelesaian sekitarnya secara litigasi Bagaimana ya? Yang kedua, yang kedua itu di dalam bisnis ada namanya IDR ya, alternatif penyelesaian sengketa atau penyelesaian sengketa alternatif ya. Di sini tentu ya yang pertama yang secara terstruktur adalah arbitrase. Arbitrase ini ya, ini apa namanya semi daripada peradilan umum. Ya, dia di luar pengadilan tetapi ya prosesinya ya ada yang seperti apa yang dikatakan arbitor atau arbitrase atau majelis arbitrase ya ini berwenang juga untuk menyelesaikan ya, perkara di luar pengadilan. Nah, bagaimana dengan arbitrase ya ini yang yang secara nasional itu diatur dalam Undang-Undang 30 tahun 99 tentang ya arbitrase. Ini Indonesia. Tetapi ya di dalam Undang-Undang arbitrase ini juga menggambarkan bagaimana Ya, penyelesaian sengketa bisnis internasional. Ya, di dalam pasal 65 ya dinyatakan di sini bahwa untuk penyelesaian sengketa bisnis ya peradilan ya arbitrase internasional ya baru dapat diakui dan dilaksanakan di wilayah hukum Indonesia jika memenuhi syarat yaitu putusannya itu dijatuhkan oleh arbiter atau majelis arbitrase ya di suatu negara yang mana Indonesia terikat pada perjanjian baik secara bilateral maupun secara multilateral. Artinya ya di dalam undang-undang itu juga mencapa, mengakui bahwa ya penyelesaian sengketa bisnis secara internasional diakui di Indonesia. Tentu yang memutuskannya adalah arbitrase yang terdaftar. Nah, salah satu arbitrase internasional yang yang saya contohkan adalah Singapore International Arbitration Center ya atau yang dikenal dengan CIAC ya atau bahasa kerennya di apa di dunia itu adalah terkait dengan sikat ya atau apa terkait dengan CIAC itu ya kemudian ya tentu ya ada bagaimana dengan putusan arbitrase internasional yang bisa diimplementasikan di Indonesia? Ya, kalau terkait dengan uh, pelaku bisnis, maka apabila sudah diputuskan oleh arbitrase internasional, maka ya didaftarkan, ya didaftarkan di Pengadilan Negeri Indonesia, yaitu di Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta Pusat. Jadi semua dokumen-dokumen yang apa yang sudah di putuskan oleh Mahkamah Internasional maka ya secara resmi harus didaftarkan di Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta Pusat maka ya berdasarkan ya 
tentu dokumennya dilengkapi dari awal sampai akhir mulai dari permohonan ya kemudian ada termohon pemohon kemudian uh, arbiter majelis arbiter kemudian ada pemeriksaan daripada berkas-berkas daripada apa namanya penyelesaian sengketa itu kemudian sudah disepakati oleh para pihak maka didaftarkan di Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta Pusat ya kalau sudah diputuskan yang apa diterima oleh Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta Pusat maka dieksekusi oleh Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta Pusat ya tetapi ada apa diktum lain yang menyatakan bahwa terkait dengan sekitar um, dengan negara terkait dengan negara Republik Indonesia sudah diputuskan oleh Mahkamah Internasional maka eksekusinya harus didaftarkan melalui Mahkamah Agung Republik Indonesia ini adalah ada dua dua apa namanya dua institusi yang berbeda yang melaksanakan apa namanya keputusan arbitrase internasional ya para bapak ibu peserta webinar yang kami hormati ya kemudian kami lanjutkan apakah bagaimana setiap putusan arbitrase internasional itu apakah bisa dilaksanakan di Indonesia ya jadi tidak mutlak yang harus dilaksanakan oleh Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta Pusat atau Mahkamah Agung tentu harus yang memenuhi persyaratan ya persyaratan tentu yang ditetapkan oleh negara Indonesia kemudian apakah bisa ya negara Republik Indonesia menolak daripada apa namanya arbitrase internasional untuk diterapkan di negara Republik Indonesia ya tentu ya kalau dia tidak memenuhi persyaratan maka ya pemerintah Republik Indonesia bisa menolak ya permohonan pelaksanaan eksekusi keputusan arbitrase internasional di Indonesia nah, tentu dengan persyaratan-persyaratan yang sudah ditetapkan kemudian ya terkait dengan ya, apa eh, penyelesaian alternatif sengketa yang lainnya ada negosiasi ya, negosiasi ini tentu ya eh, ada para pihak yang melakukan negosiasi terkait dengan bisnis yang dilakukan ini para pihak yang memutuskan apabila ada kesepakatan daripada para pihak maka dibuatkan berita acara kesepakatan atau perdamaian yang sudah dilakukan oleh para pihak nah, ini adalah negosiasi kemudian mediasi mediasi ini adalah salah satu upaya penyelesaian sengketa yang dilakukan oleh apa namanya seorang independen yang ada perwasitan wasit yang di tengah mediasi ya pihak netral ya pihak netral ini ya melakukan mediasi para pihak yang bersengketa atau yang apa namanya para pebisnis ini yang tidak mencapai kata sepakat maka dihadirkan mediasi ya mediasi ini ya tentu ya mediasi yang memberikan saran dan pendapat terkait dengan keahlian yang dimiliki ya tetapi tidak bisa memberikan keputusan dalam pola mediasi ini siapa yang bisa memberikan keputusan adalah para pihak yang bersengketa Ya, tapi bagaimana peran daripada mediasi atau mediator dia hanya melakukan penengahan daripada permasalahan atau kasus bisnis yang dilak yang dilakukan. Kemudian konsiliasi ya, konsiliasi juga sama bagaimana upaya ya pendekatan ke dalam daripada para pihak yang yang bersengketa. Kemudian penilaian ahli, penilaian ahli ini tentu ya ahli yang sesuai dengan bis, apa bidang yang uh, keahliannya memberikan pendapat dan saran terkait dengan sengketa bisnis yang dilakukan. Nah, kemudian saya kembali kepada apa masa apa namanya penyelesaian sengketa secara arbitrase. Arbitrase itu ya ini siapa yang yang melakukan pemilihan? Nah, ini ya kita coba masuk ke select dulu ya perbandingan metode ya penyelesaian sengketa bisnis. Ya pertama ya ada proses ya proses ya pengatur ya proses kemudian kita lihat ada mediasi para pihak. Kemudian ada arbitrase, arbitrase itu adalah arbitor. Arbitor itu tentu siapa yang menuju arbitor, ya. Nah, tentu ya para pihak yang menuju, ya. Tapi bagaimana rujukan daripada arbitor itu, ya? E, tentu kalau kita di Indonesia ada namanya BANI, ya, Badan Arbitrase Nasional Indonesia. Kemudian ada e, Badan Arbitrase e, apa namanya penolpa, penanaman pasar modal Indonesia. Kemudian ada Badan Arbitrase Syariah Indonesia. Maka ya kalau di internasional tadi ya saya mencontohkan ada CIAC ya 
atau SIA ya SIA ini yang biasanya pihak internasional sering memakai ya bahkan ya kalau kita apa namanya di Indonesia kalau Bani hanya mencantumkan arbitor-arbitor yang ada di nasional Indonesia kemudian yang di tingkat lokal ada provinsi dan kabupaten tetapi ya bagaimana nanti ya Bani kita ini ya juga bisa di apa go internasional ya go internasional itu artinya nanti juga melihat bagaimana contoh ya SIA tadi atau CIA ICC ya Singapore International Arbitrage Center yaitu bisa menghadirkan ya seluruh penjuru negara bisa terdaftar sebagai hakim arbitornya ya jadi apa namanya semua negara ya sudah terdaftar di SIA itu sebagai apa namanya majelis hakim arbitor untuk menyelesaikan permasalahan saya contohkan misalnya Indonesia kalau Indonesia bermasalah maka ya arbitor yang ditunjuk itu adalah yang berasal dari Republik Indonesia ya kalau dia berasal dari apa misalnya dari uh, Singapura ya tentu arbitor Singapura yang lebih diutamakan sebagai arbiter atau majelis arbitrase untuk menyelesaikan permasalahan permasalahan bisnis internasional kemudian yang kedua prosedur ya informal kalau mediasi informal ya tentu di apa di luar daripada proses peradilan formal kemudian arbitrasi itu agak formal atau yang dikatakan semi ya, semi itu formalnya ada non formalnya juga ada ya tentu ya terkait dengan prosesi ya daripada pemeriksaan alat bukti yang diajukan oleh pemohon dan termohon ya ini yang dikatakan agak formal kemudian ya masanya juga ini ini yang yang masa yang apa kalau di apa di proses litigasi kan agak panjang ya tetapi bagaimana prosedur penyelesaian daripada mediasi ya waktunya juga lebih ringkas lebih pendek ya di sini jangka waktunya 3 sampai 6 minggu kemudian arbitrase itu adalah 3 sampai 6 bulan ya nah, ini kemudian kalau bagaimana dengan peradilan umum peradilan umum itu ya biasanya ya maksimalnya 12 tahun ya kalau dalam penyelesaian sengketa bisnis kalau kita merujuk kepada apa proses penyelesaian sengketa secara litigasi maka ya waktunya tidak bisa ditentukan ya saya mencontohkan bagaimana ya panjangnya waktu dalam penyelesaian secara litigasi biasanya para bisnis itu tidak mau menyelesaikan sengketa bisnisnya secara litigasi kecuali ya kecuali apabila ada apa namanya unsur-unsur pidana maka secara otomatis sengketa bisnis masuknya ke ranah peradilan eh, pengadilan negeri atau eh, di dalam apa eh, internasional itu adalah peradilan secara umum ya kemudian eh, terkait dengan aturan pembuktian ini kalau BDSI kan tidak perlu dibuktikan ya eh, pembuktiannya ya tentu berdasarkan ya apa namanya permasalahan awal yang diajukan oleh para pihak mau apa para pihak satu atau pihak kedua maka ya mediator itu bisa menilai bagaimana daripada penyelesaian sengketanya ini artinya ya tentu berdasarkan ya apa ringkasan daripada permasalahan yang diajukan kemudian ya arbitrase arbitrase ini agak formal dokumennya atau ada pemeriksaan dokumen atau saksi ahli Ya, ini agak formal. Tetapi bagaimana? Siapa yang bisa meminta? Tentu majelis arbitrase atau arbitor itu yang bisa meminta kepada para pihak untuk membuktikan ya dokumen-dokumen yang dimiliki atau yang diajukan itu berdasarkan dokumen yang dimiliki para pihak. Kemudian ya di dalam arbitrase juga ya para pihak itu apa arbit, majelis arbitrase juga bisa meminta ya keterangan ah, apa saksi ahli ya apabila dalam dalam pemeriksaan pemeriksaan itu para apa dokumen dan para saksi belum memenuhi apa yang yang apa dan belum dimengerti oleh para uh, majelis arbitor maka saksi ahli bisa dihadirkan untuk memberikan keterangan ya ini tentu ya yang paling ujung tentu ada apa namanya proses daripada apa namanya uh, peradilan di atau pengadilan umum maka ya sifatnya adalah uh, secara formil ya tentu 
berdasarkan kitab undang-undang hukum acara perdata ya kemudian bagaimana dengan publikasi ini bers- kalau mediasi tentu bersifat pribadi atau privat ya. ya kemudian ya ya di arbitrase juga bersifat privat ya tetapi bagaimana dengan keputusan daripada peradilan umum ya tentu formil yang bersifat yang harus diumumkan dan terbuka untuk umum kemudian ya eh, hubungan para pihak ya kooperatif ya nah, ini kalau di apa BDC tentu ya diharapkan ya yang yang bertemu itu tentu para pihak yang pihak eh, mediator dia akan hanya sebagai penengah ya tentu harus di apa diminta kooperatif daripada para pihak itu ke, apa itikat baik untuk menyelesaikan permasalahan bisnis yang dihadapi kemudian ya ini di sini ya polanya adalah ya apa uh, bermusuhan ya bermusuhan itu artinya bukan apa namanya ada ada dua dua pihak yang bersaling berhadapan ya ada pihak uh, pemohon ada pihak termohon yang dalam apa namanya dalam arbitrasi ya uh, kemudian di apa di peradilan umum ya tentu ada penggugat dan tergugat ya di dalam kasus apa hukum per, apa perdata ini Kemudian ya terkait dengan uh, fokus penyelesaian menuju masa depan yang lebih baik ya uh, tentu di dalam apa putusan uh, mediasi yang memutuskan para pihak tentu dibuat akta perdamaian daripada penyelesaian sekitar itu sendiri. Ya. Uh, yang berikutnya adalah arbitrase ya ini mengenai mas itu telah ke, apa yang sudah dilaksanakan. Ten minutes bapak. Already. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little reminder. <laughs> yeah. uh, baik kita lanjutkan ya cara uh, cara melakukan apa tentu ya cara berne- apa negosiasi ya kompromi sama keras mempertahankan prinsip sama keras mempertahankan prinsip ya kemudian komunikasi ya memperbaiki yang lalu mengha- ya kemudian di arbitrase menghadapi jalan buntu. Ya di apa di peradilan umum juga menghadapi jalan buntu hasil yang dicapai baik ya saya coba apa slide yang apa berikutnya Bu Opi ya ada yang masalah internasionalnya ya la, la, apa lanjut ya lanjut saya coba apa ma- melihatkan bagaimana ya lanjut lanjut yang di terkait dengan karena waktu ya yes ya lanjut lanjut Ya lanjut ini ya ini ya 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 ini jenis jenis uh, perja, uh, ya lanjut 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 dikit lagi Pak Bu Yopi lanjut ah ya nih baik ya. Pelaksanaan putusan arbitrasi nasional ya uh, eksekutornya adalah pe- ya stop Bu Yopi ya ya ini pelaksanaan putusan arbitrasi nasional eksekutornya pengelolaan negeri ya tahapan eksekusi ya pendaftaran arbitrasi ya ini tentu di ya, paling lambat 30 hari setelah putusan dijatuhkan oleh ya uh, arbitrasi nasional maupun uh, arbitrasi internasional ya ini tentu Ya permohonan eksekusinya ya di apa disampaikan ke Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta Pusat ya. Tapi ada sebenarnya ada wacana yang menyampaikan bagaimana ya permasalahannya bisnisnya berada di Pulau Batam. Apakah tetap Jakarta Pusat yang melaksanakan putusan arbitrasi internasional? Ini ada dua dua opsi yang disampaikan para ahli bahwa nanti ya tentu ya kalau di dalam undang-undang arbitrasi Indonesia maka ya hanya satu-satunya adalah pengadilan negeri Jakarta Pusat ya untuk melaksanakan eksekusi daripada putusan arbitrasi internasional baik ya saya lanjutkan sedikit lagi ya slide-nya Pak Zul nah ini ya pelaksanaan putusan arbitrasi internasional Ya eksekutornya Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta Pusat. Ini ya ada ada muncul ya pertanyaannya pada saat saya membahas webinar internasional ini dalam kesempatan yang lain menyatakan bahwa ya bagaimana ya, ada pertanyaan menyatakan bagaimana kasusnya di Padang Pak ya 
apakah eksekusinya tetap pengadilan negeri Jakarta Pusat. Nah, ini kan apa ada ada apa ada ya ada permasalahan dalam proses eksekusi. Ya, misalnya negara-negara mitra itu mitra bisnisnya berada di Singapura. Ya, satu ada di Singapura, ada di Indonesia. Kemudian ada satu di di apa di Amerika, kemudian ada satu di uh, Indonesia tapi di daerah-daerah yang ada di Indonesia seperti Kepulauan Batam, ya. Maka eksekusinya bagaimana? Apakah didaftarkan di Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta Pusat, Pak? Ya. Tentu ya, kalau secara hukum formil di Indonesia yang menyelesaikan atau yang mendaftarkan proses apa eksekutor ini itu adalah tetap di Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta Pusat. Ya, ini coba dilanjutkan sedikit lagi slide-nya. Nah, ini ya. Syarat-syarat pengakuan putusan arbitrasi internasional, ya. Putusan arbitrasi internasional dijatuhkan dalam majelis arbitrasi di suatu negara ya dengan ya terikat pada perjanjian baik secara bilateral maupun multilateral mengenai pengakuan dan pelaksanaan arbitrasi internasional. Arbitrasi internasional sebagaimana huruf A ya terbatas pada putusan yang menuju Indonesia termasuk dalam ruang lingkup ya hukum Indonesia. Putusan arbitrasi internasional sebagaimana dimaksud dalam huruf A hanya dapat dilaksanakan di ya terbatas pada putusan yang tidak bertentangan dengan keterbitan. Jadi intinya di dalam permasalahan keputusan arbitrasi internasional atau apa ya, internasional Ya, Mahkamah Agung dan Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta Pusat ya bisa menolak ya uh, untuk pelaksanaan eksekutor daripada pelaksanaan uh, putusan itu apabila tidak memenuhi persyaratan. Tapi apabila memenuhi persyaratan maka ya apa Pengadilan Negeri atau Mahkamah Agung Republik Indonesia wajib melaksanakan putusan daripada uh, arbitrase internasional. Saya rasa demikian, ya, saya kembalikan kepada moderator Ibu Ika Florentina. Bapak uh, Swamperi, ya, that already share about how to complete dispute of business that might have occurred during this pandemic and how can be applied in Indonesia. Very good, ya, the material. Okay, just reminder again for all participants that want to ask question. Please write your question by chat rooms and mention your name, your institution, and also to whom question the deliver to. The third presenter will be Mr. Miko Kamal, PhD, that will be present about legal obligation of unemployed people in the outbreak of COVID-19, an Indonesian constitution perspective. Before, I would like to present his profile. Miko Kamal, SHLM and... Uh, PhD is an Indonesian lawyer. He's completed his doctoral education PhD and also master degree in business law at Macquarie University Sydney and Deakin University Melbourne. He earned a law degree from Bung Hatta University in Padang in 2009 and 2010 while undergoing his doctoral program. Miko was entrusted to be president of the Australian Indonesian Student Association. In addition, in addition to running a profession as a lawyer, lecturer, and columnist, also in several print and online media, Miko also active in social activity activities with disabilities. Okay, so Mr. Miko Kamal, S I L M PhD, time is your ten minutes, sir. Please, thank you. Okay, um, anyone can hear my voice clearly? Yes, Bapak. Yes, clearly. Clearly. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Bu, Bu Ika. <laughs> yes, as a moderator today, I um I want I want to convey my convey my say hello to honorable Bapak Rektor um Bapak uh, Tabdil Husni and uh, honorable Uh, Bu Uning, the Dean, dean of uh, Law Faculty Buhara University and uh, honorable our speakers today, especially for Mia Mahmudur Rahim, my friend. Um, we at the same university, 
when I did my my PhD degree at Macquarie University. Um, hello, Mahmoud. Um, also, um, I'm, so, uh, I'm, I'm going to say hello to, um, to our host today and also all of participants of um, international webinar today. And I'm uh, so sorry, I have to speak um, in English today. Uh, allow me to speak in English, even I can speak Bahasa well. Um, okay. Um, I, I will, I will share screen. Okay. Um, my topic today
action and intellectual life. So the points actually are three. The first one is the government is obliged to protect the whole people without discrimination. And the second one is the government of Indonesia has obligation to advance general prosperity or public welfare. And the third point is the government of Indonesia have to develop the nation intellectual intellectual life. And I and I and I concerned about the advantage of general pros, prosperity. Okay, this is the second one, the constitutional basis of of uh, the topic today. You can you can see the Article Twenty Seven, Paragraph Two, the 1945 Constitution. It say, it says every citizen so so have the right to work and to earn a human livelihood. See, every the first the first point is in this article is every citizen no have the right to work okay every people every every indonesian shall have the right to work and second one the government is obliged to provide it so every every citizen of indonesia shall have the right to work and who responsible to provide it the government is obliged to provide it so that's the two point of the um, article 27 paragraph paragraph 2 the 1945 constitution okay let me continue so now is i'm talking about the branch, the branches of general prosperity so in in the article in the article of 27 i said the government obliged to provide work and obliged to provide the general pros 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 uh, prosperity. And the branches is some, um, the first one is clothing and housing. Second one is health services. And the third one is jobs. Means government have to, have to provide clothing and housing for all Indonesian people. The government have have to provide health health services for Indonesian people, and also the third one, the government of Indonesia has obligation to provide jobs for all people of Indonesia, for all citizen citizen of Indonesia. Okay, let me tell you about the fact of providing jobs. Okay, I'm I'm talking about the fact the fact of the fact of providing job in Indonesia. In fact, in the in fact, the management of the state or the government is not able to fully carry out its obligation to, to provide job. Okay. In the fact, yeah, I, I say again, in the fact, government is not able to fully carry out to fully carry out its obligation to provide job. Therefore, government requests the help of employers or businessmen to find job for ci for citizen for citizen in need. So, when when government when when government can't provide any job, can't provide all of job that need by that need by um, Indonesian people, government come to businessmen, government come to come come to entrepreneur to um, to get help from to get help help, uh, help from employers or businessmen to provide job for the citizen um, the citizen and now i want to see about the state of state obligation yeah by by providing job by providing job by employers it doesn't mean that all the obligation and responsibilities of the state to provide job are absolutely erased or transferred to employers. It means when when businessmen provide job to to um, to the workers or to all of Indonesian citizens, 
it doesn't mean it doesn't mean the obligation of state is erased or or, or the obligation of state transferred to employees because constitutionally obligation of providing job remain on the shoulders of the state so constitutionally and and this business this businessmen come to help to help government to provide new job for workers or for indonesian people again it doesn't mean it doesn't mean all of all of obligation all obligation to provide job um, transfer to transfer to um, um, transfer to a businessman or entrepreneur so the burden the burden still in shoulders of the state it's not transfer automatically okay so now no matter how great a businessman is he remains under the state control as the controller of the availability of proper work this control is carried out by the state through various form of job licensing so it doesn't mean it it mean even even businessman providing any job to worker so the control of the job the control of the job still in hand of government why because any any form of licensing to uh, to making or to creating any job still in hand of in hand of government so what is entrepreneur's responsibility in normal situation okay in a normal situation government is greatly helped by employees who provide many job yeah in the normal situation entrepreneurs put the responsibility on their shoulders okay in the norm, in, in the normal situation again government is greatly helped by employers who provide many job and entrepreneurs put the responsibility on their shoulder on their on their shoulders so so what what about responsibility in difficult situation okay in difficult situation such as the covid-19 pandemic government intervenes again should intervenes again to its citizen who lost their job yeah so the founding fathers who drafted the constitution already away of this form the very beginning so so i i will provide you the article 34 paragraph 1 the 1945 impoverishing impoverished person or poor poor person and abandoned children shall be taken care shall be taken care of by the state so it's very clear impoverished person or poor people and abandoned children shall be taken be taken care of by the state okay so what about so what about the 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 law of employment the law of employment said no work no pay this very clear covid-19 makes most companies or entrepreneurs suffer loss yeah because of covid-19 because of covid-19 companies and uh, all entrepreneurs suffer loss no no work no work can be done so there is no more work than can be done by workers yeah and no work no pay that is the consequence see um just read the article 93 paragraph 1 law number 13 of 2003 it said wages are not pay if workers do no work yeah 10 minutes already bapak okay this is last this is last slide thank you okay i'm um, yeah i'm going to say conclusion of the of the my presentation today so the first one is referring to article 34 paragraph 1 of the constitution of the condition the government must take over all of the responsibilities that have been placed on the shoulders of employees there is no other choice yeah it's according to article 34 paragraph 1 second one the state must intervene 
to care for of the new poor people or jobless by fulfilling all their basic need. The, the third one, from the perspective of the constitution, if it's very clear that the main responsibility for saving workers who are affected by the COVID-19 pandemic lies with the government, not the entrepreneur who hired them in normal situation. So, and the last and the last one, I know that not all of businessmen is a good businessman. So that's why a naughty businessman who used this, this uh, difficult moment for his personal interest is certainly another way to handle it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ibu Ika. Thank you very much, uh, Bapak Miko Kamal, SHLM PhD. They already shared about legal obligation of unemployment people in the outbreak of COVID-19 in Indonesia constitution perspective. This is becoming our concern here, yeah, all about the unemployed people, especially in this pandemic era. The fourth presenter will be Professor Dr. Ha Shafrinaldi, SHMGL, Director of University Islam Riau, that will be present about legal obligation of unemployed people in the outbreak of, uh, sorry, uh, that will be present. Okay, before present uh, the material, I would like to present his profile. Professor Dr. Ha Shafrinaldi, SHMGL, he is a professor, served as a rector of Riau Islamic University. Then Mr. Shafrinaldi also has completed his S2 and S3 previously in Delhi University, India in 1993, and uh, also in University of the Bundeswehr Munich, German in 2000. And until now, there have been many awards that Mrs. Sabrinaldi has received. One of them is Satya Lenchana Karya Satya from the President of Indonesia in 2017. Professor Dr. Hai Sabrinaldi, SHMGL, time is yours. <clears throat> 10 minutes, sir. Thank you. Oke, okay, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Mrs. Uh, very nice moderator. Thank you, Ika Florentina, for giving me opportunity this time, and I will be the last speaker maybe this afternoon. Still another one, Bapak. You are the oh, fourth. Still another one. <laughs> Still Ibu Susana after this. <laughs> I want to call my uh, colleague. Professor Adil and Bu Uning, Esedin, Law Faculty, Tas Bung Hatta, and my old colleague, Dr. Kamal, Nico Kamal, has been a long time not to meet you in Padang or anywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, all the participants of this international webinar, I'm very pleased to be here and to share with you all about our topic today, and I will talk. I I've already delivered my screen to the committee. Maybe you can show, or you can show my screen to participants. Hello? Can you show my PowerPoint screen to the participants? <clears throat> okay. Is it not possible? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if we talk about the business commodity in any era, whether COVID-19 or before or in the future, 
I think in this era, I would like to say that business community in normal situation and in COVID-19 situation that we, fa we are facing now are the same. What are them? They are intellectual products. The products is created by the intellectual of human being. Let's say, yes. Next, next, next. Okay. No, no, before, for the third. Before, before. Okay, this one. <clears throat> what we are doing in business, the businessmen are doing now, is intellectual product. It's most the business commodity they all conduct right now. Even in the COVID-19 pandemic, these things are becoming the main business commodity. Next. Yes. Now we can see what is it? There is COVID-19. Is the symbol or the picture of the COVID-19. On the left side and on the right side, we can see this Clorox and hand sanitizer and vaccine and come next. Next screen, yes. Until now, there is no vaccine for this deadly disease, coronavirus 19. Yeah. That is mean that every country, every person who are capable creating vaccines they are now in competition to create them. Let's say many countries are doing these things right now, like USA, China, UK, even Indonesia, and maybe so many other countries are doing the same thing. They are conducting research in order to invent the vaccine against the COVID-19 so if the country or the person as inventor find the vaccine, that means the products is intellectual property products would be the best commodity for the best seller in the world because billions of people in the world needed to consume this vaccine and in this way they can protect themselves, the health, the body from the COVID-19 deadly disease. Next. Yeah, this business, vaccine business becomes uh, create money and money for the inventor and for the industries. We don't know until now which vaccine is uh, will be the first one to be consumed by the human being for us. We heard from the government, from the media, that in Indonesia right now, there are vaccines produced by China are being tested for the human being. And we'll see the result, whether it is it will be effective or not. It will depend on the expert to evaluate the vaccines. This one of the example that the world most best commodity right now in the future, if inventor can find the vaccine 
to protect ourselves from COVID-19. Next. I would like to say that intellectual property is assets. Everybody knows, and we know maybe every, uh, is this participant of this webinar, that the richest man in the world, who is he? Who is the richest one in the world? He is Jeff Bezos. The second one is Bill Gates. And third one, and so white. They are the creator of intellectual property in the world. They are very beneficial for all the human beings. Let's say Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon. He owns the applications of online business between the producers and the consumers. Through this way, he becomes the richest one in the world since a few years ago. And through this intellectual property as assets, we can see, we can see the, the, picture, the, the figures that I show you, that it creates much, much money from this intellectual property licensing trademarks and copyright example. The owner of the trademarks and copyrights can own around 100 billion US dollars per year, per year. Do you know that, I would like to give another example in the copyright, J.K. Rowling, the author of Harry Potter, she can earn more than 600 million per day, 600 million rupiah is Indonesian currency per day. You just think how much she earned one month, one year. From the other source, like IPR licensing patents, this in terms of technology, all the technology, all the machines and industries. From this way, licensing, license is a product of law, is legal documents, can produce billions of US dollars per year by using technology under the license of one company. In this phenomena, we can see easily when we purchase a product, a technology, let's say a shoe or electronics tools. We look at the backside made in Japan, but produced in China under the license of Japan's company, like Canon, etc. That means that law has become a tool to create money in the era of technology or era industrial revolution 4.0. Next. So what we need now in COVID era or in normal era, the law must come to protect these products because these products to be the business commodities in the world, everywhere, in any countries. We can do the same thing, the same products we can find Samsung, for example, in Indonesia easily, in India, in UK, in USA, anywhere. So this thing, and like other properties also, they should be protected by law. If not, somebody will do something wrong against the law. 
And in these situations, the law will come if somebody breaks the law. So in this reason, we talk about the law enforcement. The law should be enforced because a breach of law has taken place. In this business dispute settlement, as explained by the previous speaker, there are many methods I use by the companies, by the businessmen to settle their problems, their legal problems, mostly the business problems. I would like to explain to you the dispute the settlement of the intellectual property right applicable in WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organizations in Geneva, Swiss. This body, as a part of United Nations organizations, they recognize so many methods to settle the business in IPR. Like expert determination, expert determination. How come if spatial technology come to a dispute, a legal dispute, it cannot be solved by the legal, by the lawyer. It can only be settled properly and rightly by the expert of the matter concern, like in technology. Of course, it could be also the expert is a lawyer if the dispute regarding law. And the second one, negotiations. Negotiation is very common practicing by all the businessmen in the world. Even ourselves are often practicing these negotiations when we make business or deal with somebody else. The third one, arbitration. Arbitration is a process of dispute settlement by the juries, by the arbitrators. Mm -hmm. They are consisting of panels who will decide the case. But of course, these methods are very quite different with the code. It's not the same. It's a win-win solution method as character of this alternative dispute resolution. And the last one is mediation. Mediation is one of the methods to settle a business problem between two parties by inviting mediator who are independent to give and to hear the, the parties and then explain the things to the parties and, and come to the conclusions, this thing should be uh, given to the both parties who are having problem, legal problems. I think these methods are very uh, well known mm -hmm. in business uh, in business practice in all over the world, in any countries. Okay, comes to the next screen. Now I have still the IP filings before, before the conclusion. Mm -hmm. Before the conclusion. Oh, sorry. I don't know how come it's different with my with my script. Sorry, my conclusion, intellectual property always become business commodity today and for tomorrow. Then they should be protected by law. And if the breach of law take place, the law enforcement should be made 
by the is uh, the, the obligations of the government and for everybody to enforce their law to respect the innovations the copyright the trademarks etc thank you Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Profesor Dr. Hasha Prinaldi, SHMCL, that already share in depth about the international business perspective COVID-19 pandemic. The last but not least, we have the most beautiful speaker today, Dr. Zuzana Muhammad Said, a senior fellow of law, the Faculty of Economic Management, University Kebangsaan Malaysia. She was a practicing advocate, solicitor, uh, specializing in banking, legitation, foreclosures, insolvency, and also uh, appointment in judicial and legal service attached to the Attorney General Chambers of Malaysia. She was also assigned to various government uh, departments, including the Ministry of Finance and also Ministry of uh, Housing and Local Government, and also. She was also the alumni fellow of for advocacy skill faculty of law UKM. Her PhD was on a conflict of law focusing on family and child law. Dr. Susana Muhammad said, time is yours. 10 minutes, please. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum and uh, selamat petang kepada um, semua. Uh, kepada Rektor uh, Universiti uh, Bung Hatta, kepada uh, Dekan uh, Faculty of Law uh, Bung Hatta University, um, the moderator, uh, the chairperson and all distinguished speakers. So, uh, tajuk saya pada hari ini adalah uh, sedikit berkaitan dengan uh, commercial contracts. Um, dan ada slides uh, yang saya boleh sharekan. I'll, I can share the slides with you. It will just be a short presentation. Um, mm -hmm. I try to, to share the slides, yeah? Yes, please. Um, Can you see the slides? Uh, still okay. on progress. Okay. Yes. Can you see the slides? Yes, already. Okay. 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 Um, this is uh, the slides is specially uh, presented for International Webinar Series of the Law, Buhata University. Um, and uh, my topic is on uh, minimizing the legal risk of commercial contracts during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, basically, uh, what do we expect from this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Um, of course, uh, there are more of uh, negative things that people uh, need time to overcome all the uh, impacts of COVID-19, right? So uh, accordingly uh, to the business uh, people, the edge markets uh, in 2020 this year said that the retail group Malaysia estimate a total of 209 stores, 9,000 uh, stores, accounting for 61% of total retail outlets in the country and 63.3% of total retail sales were closed during the first six weeks of the movement control order in Malaysia. Malaysia uh, started its first uh, movement control order, some sort like a partial lockdown, uh, on the 18th of March to 2020. Okay, we are still uh, under the movement control order um, and uh, it's uh, going on until 31st of August. But uh, many sectors, uh, many um, uh, companies, many uh, activities have uh, started uh, with a strict uh, standard of uh, operating procedures. Okay, um, all right, uh, this also relate to a uh, few uh, problems such as uh, additional uh, staff costs, including uh, matters on salaries, sorry for that, uh, salaries and wages, allowances, and statutory contributions, the uh, profit, provident fund. Uh, so the issues uh, in this matter uh, that, regard, that relates to the commercial contracts 
um, uh, basically on jurisdiction or choice of law, uh, meaning that um, normally if you have a contract, a commercial contract, you would state which law you would like to be abide by. For example, if you want to use Indonesian law, then you should state in your contract. If you want to use uh, Malaysian law, then you should state which law because that is the most important thing in things when, when dispute comes. Because during COVID-19, there are many things that have uh, been pending uh, projects cannot be uh, performed due to the uh, lockdown and things like that. So other than that is that time. Time is always important when you are doing business uh, because uh, time is, uh, is of essence. Yeah. So in terms of completion period and performance, um, it's uh, inevitable that the existing contracts would give uh, way to greater risk of default and potential insolvency. So uh, other than that, um, some can say that uh, it's a force majeure event, uh, but uh, it's still something that you have to prove in court if the other party, uh, the other side does not agree with you. So uh, other than that is on damages, the issues on damages and compensation for delay, as well as frustration or suspension. Uh, for example, if uh, a contract, normally a contract would have a force majeure event but if they don't have it uh, what will happen is that they can still in Malaysia rely on the contracts act uh, what I can say is that in in all government uh, contracts that involve uh, commercial transactions with companies and all for development um, etc we could definitely have force majeure clause uh, this is to protect the government uh, because uh, whatever contracts uh, deal by the government is actually the people's money. All right, uh, so this is just some um, the, uh, elaboration on uh, frustration uh, and force majeure, the difference between the two. Okay, all right, uh, so generally frustration will not apply when uh, it has been identified as a force majeure, so it's either one. Yeah? Right, uh, so my suggestions, uh, this is just short slides from me. So, uh, so a few more slides more. This is suggestions uh, how to overcome uh, the problem during COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, this is something that um, companies um, can try to consider. Uh, how to mitigate the losses, how to mitigate um, uh, any problems that may arise from the uh, performance of the contract. That means, first of all, it's uh, you have to look at your contract document. Of course, you will have your lawyers to look at it, but uh, it's no harm also for you to learn and understand. So um, you can look at the uh, clauses which can offer assistance to you. Uh, for example, which obligations uh, may be uh, potentially affected or disrupted? Um, is there a possible breach and what's the consequences? Uh, other than that, you can consider whether any preventative steps can be taken uh, that could actually uh, help you to minimize uh, the losses. Uh, uh, something like uh, negotiated solutions. And then uh, in terms of claim for damages, um, under common law, loss is limited to what uh, happened in the ordinary course or things under special circumstances. If the relevant loss, uh, loss losses eh, does not clearly fall within these categories, then it's too remote and you can still say that uh, it's not allowed for damages. Okay, so uh, other than that, you can look at your commercial contracts to see the existence of a limitation of liability um, exclusion clause ETC. Right, uh, so uh, other than that, my, my suggestions are that uh, whether there are any other ways to perform contractual obligations, uh, consider a way to mitigate the effects of the present situation. Maybe you could also negotiate uh, to extend the performance or completion period. For example, if the completion period is uh, within two, two years, maybe you can negotiate to say that uh, it could be uh, extended further. But of course, a contract is um, agreement by, by two parties, by all the parties. Um, so you need to have um, consent uh, and agreement uh, 
by, by all the parties involved in the contract. Right. Uh, other than that, you can also monitor the announcement of any new governmental or regulatory policies uh, because uh, sometimes a government will give moratorium uh, relief uh, and compensation to companies. This is some sort of like um, uh, government's initiative. Um, other than that, uh, there's also a possibility for you to look at your insurance coverage and see whether there's any potential uh, to see that uh, you, you can uh, apply uh, for um, any claim uh, on it. Um, but I doubt it, but it's, it's, it's uh, nothing to lose if you can just check on it. Uh, okay, in uh, just an example, the legislative initiative in Malaysia, uh, in Malaysia apart from the uh, stimulus package and all, government also have uh, uh, companies exemption with uh, number two order 2020, which provided uh, protection for companies from being wound up uh, under insolvency. Uh, it used to be 21 days, now it's six months for statutory demand. That means a longer time uh, frame for a company to be uh, taken to court for winding up. Uh, it has to be at least six months of a default. And also we have uh, been, uh, some uh, uh, amendment to the uh, Employee Provident Fund that allow withdrawal by members, which is actually uh, quite helpful to some of us uh, yeah, for to our sustainable living during COVID-19 because of, uh, as uh, previously mentioned by all the speakers, um, that uh, losses of job and things like that happen. Yeah? Right. So uh, other than that, we're also um, having a COVID-19 bill, but it's still pending. Uh, some say it's too late already, but some say that no, it's no harm. It can be retrospective, so we'll wait for it because our parliament is sitting at the moment. So we wait on that. Uh, the purpose is to assist businesses in rebuilding the economy. Um, um, other than that, what I can say that we only look at COVID-19 as something negative for the most of us, um, most of the in most aspects. But I think there's still some positive side of it, which like, uh, for example, we are now more learner in IT. We go on for cashless transaction. We go on uh, digital entrepreneurship, something new, something we have to change to suit the situation. A better environment uh, and we are more health conscious uh, we are uh, uh, hygienic uh, in the in terms that um, whenever we go out we'll make sure that we have a hand sanitizer and things like that our mask and all uh, new norm for business um, we also have online teaching now which actually uh, good at, at, uh, I have to uh, I have students in Indonesia as well, but, but we can still come together on our online teaching. Uh, other than that, the most, um, I mean, as, as a mother, I love most because I can work from home and can be with my family uh, without uh, uh, my, my work at all. And of course, digitalization is most uh, part of it that we have to do uh, online uh, work and things like that. So uh, basically, uh, that's all I want to say for this um, uh, um, webinar, seminar. Um, and uh, just now I forgot to say, to mention that uh, I'm, I'm, I would like to thank uh, the committee for inviting me uh, to this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Susana M. Fett. <laughs> okay. Uh, we already in a 4 p.m. actually. Uh, now uh, we have two questions uh, to short the time. So I would like uh, I would uh, like to uh, present and also to uh, read the question from the participant. The first question is from Div Wahyuni. A question to Bapak Swamperi. How effectively resolve business dispute during the COVID, uh, current COVID-19 pandemic? To Bapak Swamperi, in Indonesia, bagaimana cara menyelesaikan sengketa bisnis yang efektif pada masa pandemi COVID-19 atau sekarang? Uh, silahkan, Bapak Swamperi, please. Time is yours. Bapak Aswamperi, 
Rosro here. Bapak Swamperi. Or maybe is there any uh, others speaker that can answer about this? Bapak Swamperi masih um, online? Maybe would you like to repeat the question? Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bapak. Okay, I will repeat the question. Question coming to uh, coming from uh, Div Wahyuni. How to effectively resolve business dispute during the current COVID-19 pandemic? Bagaimana cara menyelesaikan sengketa bisnis yang efektif pada masa COVID pandemic sekarang? Is there any uh, one wants to answer this, please? Okay. Um, boleh saya uh, cakap sikit? Oh, ya? Yes, ha. thank you. Please, Ibu Susana. Ya, yeah, uh, saya rasa tadi pun uh, kita ada bercerita uh, bila ada pertelingkahan uh, ada beberapa cara yang boleh digunakan Cara-cara uh, uh, yang dimentionkan itu sebenarnya boleh terpakai juga sama ada sebelum COVID-19 atau se se semasa COVID-19 atau hmm. selepas COVID-19 Jadi uh, mediation, uh, arbitration dan litigation ada ketiga-tiganya itu adalah pilihan yang kita boleh buat Ya, tapi uh, of course seperti mana yang bapak tadi telah bentangkan uh, mediation adalah cara yang paling uh, efisien sekali sekarang kalau nak disebutkan sebab saya juga adalah uh, associate mediator untuk Singapore Mediation Center dan memang pilihan itu adalah sangat yang terbaik lah jadi itu adalah beberapa pilihan untuk penyelesaian jika itu menjawab soalan yang dikemukakan selain itu juga yang tadi saya telah tunjukkan commercial contracts beberapa klosa-klosa uh, yang boleh dilihat untuk membantu dalam menangani isu berkaitan ganti rugi dan juga penamatan kontrak dan sebagainya Terima kasih Okay, thank you very much Ibu Susana Okay, the second question Yes, Bapak? Ya, sudah bagus suaranya Yes, Pak Ah, finally, you there ya. Gimana pertanyaannya okay. tadi Ibu Ika? Ya Pertanyaannya tadi, uh, ada dua pertanyaan sebenarnya yang ditujukan ya. untuk Bapak Suamperi. Mungkin bisa langsung dijawab ya Pak ya. Saya ya. pakai bahasa Indonesia atau bahasa Inggris Bapak? Bahasa Indonesia aja Mbak. Ya. <laughs> Baik. Pertanyaan yang pertama, bagaimana cara penyelesaian sengketa bisnis yang efektif pada masa pandemi COVID-19 sekarang? Kemudian kalian pertanyaan yang kedua Bapak, ini bagaimana menuntut uh, sebuah perusahaan pilot akibat pandemi? Sedangkan jelas perusahaan tersebut pilot dikarenakan sebuah wabah. Nah ini mungkin juga pertanyaan banyak kali ini. Bagaimana ya. kita pemerintah memberikan subsidi? Monggo silahkan Bapak. Terbatas. Ya, terima kasih. Terluan Pak Sampiri. Ya, terima kasih Ibu Ika Florentina. Yang pertama ya. bagaimana penyelesaian sekitar bisnis uh, era pandemi ya. Jadi uh, kalau sekitar bisnis di era pandemi ini penyelesaiannya tentu para pihak ya harus uh, mencari win-win solution ya. Pertama, tentu harus dilakukan reschedule ulang terhadap bisnis yang sudah dilakukan. Kemudian, ya di masa pandemi ini, tentu para pihak harus mengerti ya, baik uh, pihak yang menyediakan apa bisnis itu dan maupun mitra, tentu harus saling uh, pengertian, maka itu jalan terbaik dalam penyelesaian sekitar bisnis. Kalaupun tidak, tidak tercapai ya, kalau yang pertama tentu negosiasi. Ya. Negosiasi hmm. itu adalah cara yang terbaik, untuk menyelesaikan sengketa bisnis ya. Yang kedua ya kalau tidak tercapai nanti ya bisa menggunakan cara mediasi atau mediator. Mediator itu ya tingkat kedua ya. Kemudian ya kalau mediator menggunakan uh, perwasitan atau uh, apa uh, wasit tentu ya pihak netral, pihak netral ini bisa menyelesaikan permasalahan. Ya, kalaupun tidak tercapai maka ya itu terakhir tadi ada arbitrase. Arbitrasi hmm. ini juga ya apa apa namanya memang kedepankan ya saling pengertian dari para pihak ya 
intinya adalah bagaimana kesepakatan terbaik untuk mencapai uh, perdamaian. Kemudian ya, yang kedua, pertanyaan kedua terkait dengan uh, masa uh, pilotnya suatu perusahaan ya Mbak ya. Yes. Uh, itu ya tentu ada sada nanti kalau perusahaan itu pilot karena pandemi tentu ya harus diminta ada kebijakan pemerintah ya. Pemerintah biasanya harus memberikan ya, stimulus ekonomi ya bagaimana ya perusahaan-perusahaan ya terutama UMKM ya usaha yeah. kecil dan menengah kemudian perusahaan-perusahaan besar pun juga harus di apa diberikan stimulus ya terkait dengan apa namanya keadaan ekonomi daripada perusahaan itu sendiri. Saya rasa demikian ya Mbak. Thank you very much Bapak Somperi. Yeah, <laughs> Baik, for the second question uh, from uh, Dr. Dr. Yovisa ditujukan uh, for Profesor Dr. Syafrinaldi uh, bagaimana cara mempertahankan bisnis yang bersifat konvensional pada masa pandemi COVID-19? Silahkan Bapak Syafrinaldi. Ini in English atau dalam bahasa? Please Bapak, in English or in bahasa, it's up to you. Supaya langsung bisa dimengerti yes. oleh penanya. Mungkin sure, Pak. Silahkan ini. pakai bahasa Indonesia aja ya Pak ya. ya. Jadi yes. untuk mempertahankan bisnis di era revolusi 4.0 ini, harus kita meninggalkan cara-cara konvensional. Sure, maksimal. Sebab, apalagi di era COVID ini, orang mencoba untuk menjaga jarak, bers mm -hmm. tidak bersentuhan antara buyer dengan uh, consumer, ini hal yang penting untuk memutus mata rantai COVID-19 itu. Sekalipun bisnis yang dilakukan adalah bisnis kecil-kecilan seperti UMKM. Nah, di era sekarang dengan serba online ini, dengan bantuan berbagai alat yang cukup baik, sebagai kreasi dari orang-orang hebat ya. dengan aplikasinya seperti Gojek dengan GoFoodnya kemudian Grab dengan seperti GoFood juga dan lain sebagainya itu bisnis yang kecil-kecil pun orang jualnya si goreng di rumahan tanpa harus buka toko sendiri di ruko dan segala macamnya uh -huh. tetap bisa berjualan dengan bantuan uh, mediator tadi seperti GoFood yang penting kita terregistrasi dengan GoFood atau Gojek tersebut. Ya. Maka saya sampaikan dunia teknologi industri, teknologi informasi ini sudah melekat dalam kehidupan manusia, dimanapun kita berada, sekalipun di desa. Saya pikir itu uh, yang konvensional itu memang sulit untuk ya. dipertemukan saat ini. Memang ini semuanya sulit ini ya Pak ya. <laughs> every every business uh, gonna be feel the difficulties ya Pak Safrinaldi. Thank you very much for the answer Bapak. The next question is uh, for Mr. Miko Kamal. Both question actually so I can read that. Uh, the first is with the forming of COVID-19 handling committee in Indonesia, will there be a slowdown in economy restoration? And is a legal protection in order to restore the economic necessary question? And the second question is, you mentioned the government is bound to provide job to citizens. Is it possible for the jobless citizen to implement this obligation through the court? Please, uh, Prime Minister Miko Kamal, for sure. Thank you. Pa Miko Kamal, please. Dr. Miko Kamal. Mr. Miko Kamal, you know? There is no uh, Miko Kamal. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the next question, yeah, or or maybe this can be the last question, yeah, because actually our time is up. To Pak Shafinaldi lagi. Oh yeah. <laughs> so many question for you, Pak. Most so, uh, first is um. Mention uh, for Professor Safrinaldi, how how can we break down the IP take action on the grassroots level, especially to survive? We know the most academic citizen level are minimum. That is the first question, Bapak. And the second question is, uh, during the pandemic, there are many problems to solve regarding the IP matters. 
what kind of policy should be issued by the government to protect and keep the IP applicant applicants apply their invention uh, as the same as before? That is okay. Yes. Oh. For the intellectual property regimes mm -hmm. are divided into two, two groups. The first, the first one, uh, the groups that are not required to be registered for the legal protection. Mm -hmm. To get the legal protection. They are trade secret and copyright. And the rest, patent, trademark, industrial design, they need to be registered before getting the protection mm -hmm. from the law. That means if it concerns with copyright, if we just completed writing a book or short story, it will be automatically protected by law in any countries. It's a world regulations recognized by the because intellectual property is a part of human right as mentioned in article 27 um, paragraph 2 of the united nations convention on your uh, human right 1948 mm -hmm. and the second one was the questions ibu uh, the second one is uh, the first one. The first one. Oh, the, the first one. Sorry, the first one is how can we break down IP and take action on the grass grassroots level, Bapak? Especially to survive, that we know that mostly academic citizen level are minimum. Oh yes, as you know that our country Indonesia is well recognized by the world mm -hmm. as a country who has higher for the IP breach. The law, the breaking of the law, mm -hmm. infringe the law. Indonesia is one of the most country well recognized for this very bad news for us. And we can see and find very easily in every city every city even in 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 mall or plaza supermarket you can find easily the products are sold not originally and it is very well known in indonesia with the saying this kawe this yeah. product is kawe it's bonia kawe one kawe two kawe three oh, okay. and so on is not recognized in every in any country, only in Indonesia. And therefore, the infringements of law against this copyright and industrial property are very high in our country. And it's our job, our duty mm -hmm. to give the protection to help the government. And recent years, by the changings of the delict from uh, usual delict in, in penal code, mm -hmm. change to reported delicts is a very, very worse, is the worst thing for lo legal law enforcement in criminal law in Indonesia, especially in copyright. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bapak Syafrin uh, Okay. That will be the last question uh, coming from Lia di Solo Baru. Solo ini ada. Uh, mau bertanya ke Bapak Suamperi SHMH. Saya pakai bahasa Indonesia, Bapak. Oke. Okay. Yeah, Perihal okay. COVID ini memukul berbagai lini ekonomi. Bagaimana kebijakan regulasi investasi Indonesia Selain filter dari Bapepti mengenai cryptocurrency untuk melindungi hak WNI kita karena pasar pasar global meluas, walaupun masih masa pandemi. Terima kasih. Monggo silahkan, Bapak Suamperi. Ya, baik ya. Terima kasih ini Bu Florentina ya pertanyaannya. 
Ya, kalau di masa pandemi ya kebijakan pemerintah tentu harus ya apa namanya memberikan ya penguatan-penguatan daripada ekonomi masyarakat. Ya, penguatan ekonomi itu tentu ditujukan ya kepada masyarakat yang terdampak ekonomi ya. Jadi ya. kebijakan pemerintah ya sudah jelas ya banyak stimulus ekonomi ya terhadap uh, pengusaha dan masyarakat yang di yang diberikan oleh pemerintah kepada para pengusaha. Jadi apa namanya tentu ya pemerintah juga melihat ya bagaimana ya pengusaha-pengusaha terdampak itu juga melakukan proaktif juga untuk perbaikan daripada usahanya sendiri. Tadi juga ya dijelaskan oleh Prof apa Safrinaldi ya terkait dengan bagaimana uh, bertahannya perusahaan-perusahaan atau pengusaha itu di era pandemi tentu mereka harus menyesuaikan ya menyesuaikan usaha itu ya biasanya konvensional tentu sekarang di era digital ya. Jadi ada usaha timbal balik daripada apa pengusaha dan pemerintah. Jadi jangan dituntut hanya pemerintahnya saja. Ya, pemerintah sudah melakukan apa apa namanya pelonggaran, ya relaksasi, ya apa namanya keringanan keringanan terhadap para pengusaha. Ya bahkan dari sektor pajak pun di, di apa di, di apa diringankan ya pengusaha itu. Saya rasa demikian ya Mbak Florina ya. Ya baik. Itu adalah pertanyaan terakhir untuk kita hari ini. So, that's becoming the last question. It's already 4 p.m. to 20 minutes. Okay. Okay, then. Uh, after this, we still have another uh, uh, event to take a picture together. But before I leave it to the host, I would like to thank you for all amazing speakers that already shared the very genuine material today in this event uh, in international business in uh, perspective COVID-19 pandemic. And I would look at, I would like to uh, special thanks to Ibu Uning, the Dean of Law Faculty Bung Hatta University, and also Bapak Rektor Bapak Tafdil Husni SMBA that give me chance to guide this great discussion And to all, I'm so sorry if there is any mistake during this occasion. Women's regard for me, Ika Florentina, cluster GM of both Five Hotel Solo Mijalva Indonesia, Five Hotel Manahan and Solo Baru. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and stay positive. Again, thank you, and time back to host Bapak Jul Valdi. All the best for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Miss Florentina Ika, great discussion, great presentations. Miss Ika from Cluster GM Five Hotel Solo. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, our discussion very, very interesting. Thank you to uh, our moderator and special thanks to uh, our invited speakers. All our invited speakers. But, uh, I would like to announce that we have surprise and uh, let me we have uh, the prize two room vouchers from Fev Hotel Solo and three books being smart and confident sales executive so total winners for today is five persons <laughs> Our winners was Dr. Doris Rahmat. Congratulations. And second, Mr. Yulian, Yuliana, oh, sorry, uh, Mrs. Yuliana Susanti Gunawa. And uh, that's for hotel. Thank you, Miss Florentina, for the voucher. Sure. And third goes to Ibnu Masud and fourth goes to Lia and the last one Dr. Wahyuni. All right, that's uh, our winner for today. And uh, for the last one, before we close the thing today, the event today, let me do take our presentation, there are five slides. So, one, uh, one, two, three, then until five. 
Say cheese together. You could smile. Cheers. Yes. One, two, three. <laughs> okay. Very good.